So we're just going to ask everybody to mute. Um, I know some of the co-hosts have unmuted themselves to practice. So if you want to go ahead and mute yourselves again for the start of the meeting. Okay, hopefully people are, uh, I see people are still joining. Um, we, as people get on, um, hopefully everyone is um, seeing my screen, which is a welcome screen for day two. And we are gonna be using menti.com. Um, so you can see a menti.com code at the top. So you would go on to a different browser and um, open menti.com and put in this code that you see on my screen. And uh, hopefully uh, Christine might be putting this in the chat as well. Uh, so I can see people are starting to use the mentee by giving little hearts to the first, first slide. So thank you for that. Um, the numbers are still rolling in, but um, Darcy, do you want me to get started? Okay. And did you want to... Welcome people, or do you want me to just jump right in? Uh, I think you can take it away. Okay. Um, I'm gonna close up my little chat. So welcome everybody. My name is Caroline Donovan. I am facilitating the, this Florida macroalgae workshop. We're on day two. So welcome to day two. We're really excited. Um, there's a lot of interactive um, uh activities and engagement that are gonna go on during this morning's workshop. So the uh, we're starting now. Um, we have a menti.com um, code up that we would like everyone to use. And we're gonna practice that in a second. For any Zoom or Mentimeter technical questions, Christine Quigley is going to be monitoring the chat and can answer your questions. And if you feel so inclined, you can rename yourself. So in the participants list, if you find your, your name and it has a little blue button that says more um, under there, you should be able to rename yourself. And we're asking people, you know, put your name, your affiliation, but also what estuary you're from. Um, this also helps you can see the different facilitators and scribes that will be um, part of our breakout sessions later today. And just as a reminder, the workshop is being recorded. Um, this is um, uh, so that we can, you know, kind of find out what we're doing and, and keep notes, keep track of notes. And um, those recordings will be um, presented later on, especially of the presentations um, that will be given. So um, I'm gonna really quickly take a picture of my screen um, just to say hi. I have some people on there, but don't worry, it's just a few of us. All right. And we go to the next slide. Um, it's our first fun Menti question just to practice on, on using Menti. All right, everyone's getting their answers through. Awesome. I feel like it's a, a, a dog world here, maybe with some extra, a lot of people have some dogs, some people have some cats, um, few have children, which are, our uh, sympathies go out to you. Um, but in this, in this virtual world, I, I totally, I totally get it. Um, so hopefully, um, this is just a fun way to, to figure out how to use Menti. Um, and if, if, if anyone's having trouble, um, please write in the chat and ask Christine if, if you can't figure out how to use the Menti. Um, great, and uh, this question will stay open for a minute. Um, I'm gonna go to the next slide. So we had a question um, that 
yesterday at uh, the first day of the meeting about the demographics of who's attending the workshop. So we thought we'd do some fun slides about um, who's attending. And so we have a little bit of a countdown and I did, you know, curate this a little bit so that scientists and managers obviously kind of came out on top, but um, about around approximately 120 people said, I am a government um, or agency representative. 26 people labeled themselves as consultants. 25 people are members of the public, um, as well as it was multiple choice, but uh, uh, people label themselves as members of the public. There's a lot of NGO representation, a lot of river keepers, um, the Indian Friends of the Indian River Lagoon, that, um, those types of groups, which is awesome to see. We have good academic institution um, representation, and it'll be great to reach out to those folks more um, after the workshop as well. We have 12 graduate students and two undergrad students that, that are participating, which is really exciting. Um, a lot of learning going on at, at this workshop. And two elected officials, maybe there's even more, um, but uh, two people. Um, said that they are elected or appointed officials in the area. So that's a really exciting um, part of this workshop. One of the other things that we did is we actually took the zip codes from um, different people that participated. So we asked what zip code you were from and we put that on a map um, to show uh, where everybody is from. So I'm just gonna quickly go to this um, URL so we can zoom in a little bit. So here's the map that link works. And we can see there's there's some folks from the DC area, from EPA region one. I, I think there might be some QA, QC that needs to occur on these zip codes, um, but obviously uh, cool pockets around the country, but you know, especially from, from Florida. So I uh, just wanted to zoom in and say, we have really good representation from around the state and it'll be great to kind of fill in some of these gaps after the fact and, um, and see where all of our colleagues are coming from. Let's see if I can get back to <laughs> the Mentimeter. Um, all right. So the agenda for today is obviously we just did some introductions, um, um, some housekeeping with Zoom and Mentimeter. Please let me know um, or one of us know um, if you're having problems. Um, we are monitoring the chat and emails. Um, we are going to have an invited pre uh, presentation speakers starting next, um, which includes a break. Um, and then we're going to do facilitated breakouts by estuary. So you will be assigned a breakout group. Um, based on your responses when you registered, um, but we will um, certainly, you know, work through that when the when we have the breakout. We'll be giving more instructions for that. Um, we will then have a plenary um, just to touch base on how the facilitated breakouts go. Very short um, because we're going to do the report, the full report out um, on day three on Friday, and then we'll adjourn at noon. So I do want to highlight just two other things, which is. The Jamboard um, sites that we've sent out in links. So um, you should have an email, and then it was also in the chat on um, day one. The Jamboards are available for you to use now. Um, it's by estuary, and then each Jamboard has multiple slides that you can put on um, information. And there's um, the first slide gives you instructions on how to use the Jamboard, and there are two questions on that first slide that. You we're prompting you to you know, put down, where do you see macroalgal blooms? Where do you see um, seagrass loss? These kinds of questions. So um, I encourage you to go to the Jamboards at any time, but you know, at break, um, we'll be using them also in the breakouts and they are available you know, after the workshop as well. So if you find some time later tonight or tomorrow and you're pondering things, you can jump on the Jamboard and use them then. Um, okay, so we are on to our next, our first speaker. So I'm going to stop sharing. 
Um, our first speaker is Dr. Brian LaPointe from Harbor Branch, Florida Atlantic University. And I know we worked out this, the screen sharing, so um, you should be able to share your screen, Brian. And I see that you're unmuted, so that let's see if we can hear you. All right, can you hear me? Sounds good. Can you see the first slide? Yes. Great, okay. Well, I'd like to just start by thanking the organizers. I think this is a really great workshop. And I wanna thank my co-authors, Rachel Bruton and Diana Bellotti also for their, uh, their help with the presentation. And this is a photo of some macroalgae blooms right off Big Pine Key in the lower Florida Keys, the red alga rhytiella, the brown one dictyota. You can see some turtle grass blades and if you look closely over here, you'll see a blade of Calerpa prolifera. Uh, you can see how similar that looks to the, the turtle grass blades, but of course, it's a macroalga, not a seagrass. So I began studying macroalgae, oh gosh, back around 1973. Uh, and of course, the question, why study macroalgae? I thought they were just uh, an amazingly diverse, beautiful, and at that time, and beyond very important primary producers. But uh, through my career, it's become obvious that they're also early responders to nutrient enrichment, bioindicators, the eutrophication. And they're driven by uh, reactive uh, dissolved nutrients like ammonium, nitrate, and soluble reactive phosphorus. So the numeric nutrient criterion, and Dave uh, Tomasco mentioned this the other day, it really doesn't work well for macroalgae. It's really, um, those are numbers are based more for water column phytoplankton uh, blooms. But uh, the neat thing about macroalgae is bioindicators, they integrate nutrient availability that often come as pulses over weeks to months. They can store nutrients to sustain their growth over longer time periods. And we use tissue analysis of macroalgae uh, for stable isotope analysis and elemental analysis, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus to provide information on sources and the dynamics of these blooms. And we, we think this is a real opportunity, um, perhaps that's been missed in many estuaries, to use macroalgae to inform ecosystem-based management. Uh, to monitor nutrient status and restore and protect seagrass and coral reef ecosystems. And the panels on the right just kind of show, um, you know, illustrate the, the phase shifts, uh, if you will, in the Indian River Lagoon uh, from years past when we had uh, abundant seagrasses, relatively clear water. As these nutrient loads increase over time, the macroalgae expand we get more chlorophyll A up in the water, more phytoplankton. Ultimately, at the highest loads, of course, we get these massive phytoplankton blooms, uh, very dense that block the light. Uh, and of course, uh, reduced sea grasses can eliminate them. And then we see an oscillation between phytoplankton blooms like the brown tide and macroalgal blooms. Uh, when, the, when the phytoplankton terminate, you get enough light on the bottom uh, and the nutrients are in the system to drive more macroalgae blooms. And we see this with the red tide and macroalgae on the West Coast. Well, these days, uh, macroalgal blooms are a common feature globally. Uh, and in the United States, every coastal state has experienced macroalgal blooms, either red, green, or brown macroalgae, and even blue-green algae that um, Val's gonna talk about. Hawaii is the poster child for invasive, non-native invasions of macroalgae and uh, having a lot of issues on Maui right now with, uh, with blooms of these non-alien species. I wanna thank uh, Kathy Val Allistein and Joanne Burkholder, my co-authors. Chapter 15 of this book on harmful algal blooms. Uh, chapter 15 is about macroalgae. If you want to learn more about how a, a good thing, uh, macroalgae, can, can become a bad thing. Uh, I would urge you to, to maybe get a copy of that book. Um, Amazon's got four copies left. I think they're about $207. I began working with macroalgae with John Ryder at Woods Hole in the 1970s. This is a picture of John on the left at Woods Hole holding a net full of grass salaria. Uh, 
a very fast growing red seaweed that we began working with. And the idea was to use cultures of these seaweeds to remove nutrients from wastewater uh, and seawater mixtures kind of to provide advanced waste treatment. And the, the middle photo is me at Harbor Branch in the 70s where we did more research on this. And we fed these different cultures uh, of Gracilaria different combinations of nutrient supplements to Indian River Lagoon water at different flow rates, as high as 30 turnovers a day and as low as one turnover a day, seawater going through those little chambers. And fed them either ammonium sewage or nitrate. The sewage had nitrate as the reactive nitrogen form and the control cultures with no nutrient amendments. And you can see at every turnover rate, the ammonium enriched cultures did the best. Um, we feel that these cultures could have been limited by CO2 at the low turnover rates. But um, you can see uh, that the sewage and nitrate uh, treatments were below the ammonium. The ammonium is really the preferred form uh, of nitrogen. It's the most reduced form uh, by most of these bloom formers uh, that we have studied. We continued to work with this after I uh, returned uh, following my PhD uh, to work with John Ryther in Florida. We started a field project uh, right off Big Pine Key where we did dosing studies with grass hilaria in the uh, winter and summer 1983. In the winter, both nitrogen and phosphorus uh, greatly stimulated the growth of these plants in cage culture. In summer, only phosphorus. And when we look at the nutrients in the water in Pine Channel, we see that the dissolved inorganic nitrogen, again, that's ammonium and nitrate, doubled from winter to summer, roughly from one to about two and a half micromolar. And the ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus went up from eight to 30 to one. So they became very uh, phosphorus limited in the summer with the elevated uh, reactive nitrogen. And so when we actually look at the growth rates of a variety of macroalgae, not just Gracilaria, but Neoagardiella, Ulva, Dictyosphyria that bloomed in Kaneohe Bay back in the 60s and 70s, and even the giant kelp, Macrocystis, we see that they really don't need that much reactive nitrogen to maximize their growth rate, about one micromolar, that's 14 micrograms per liter, or PPB, it's pretty low. Uh, comparable to the Everglades uh, phosphorus standard uh, in the Everglades protection area. So their growth rate can become maximized at that relatively low concentration. Uh, this is the outer Great Barrier Reef, about 0.13 micromolar. Uh, and of course, you don't see macroalgal blooms out there. You see corals growing. But these algae can take up the nitrogen uh, uh, to higher levels in their tissue beyond what they need to sustain their maximum growth rates. And it's interesting that um, when you look at this, the, the yields, the amount of organic matter production, when we start seeing macroalgal blooms can be quite impressive. For example, a turtle grass uh, meadow, like we see on the right, uh, if you look in the literature, uh, you can get maybe a one to maybe two grams carbon per square meter per day. These macroalgae are, are very rapid growing uh, organisms. Some of these bloom formers like Gracilaria, up to 36 grams dry weight per square meter per day or nine grams of carbon per square meter per day. Uh, that's, that's a really high rate of primary production. And so as nutrients build up and we get these macroalgae, that really is the definition uh, that Scott Nixon put forward back in the 90s that uh, it's an increase in the rate of supply of organic matter to an ecosystem. And so organic matter begins to build up. We saw the problem worsen in the Florida Keys in the early 1990s when uh, the Florida Bay Restoration Plan was implemented and millions of acre feet of water from Lake Okeechobee was moved south through the Everglades. Most of that came through Shark River Slough. Uh, and came out uh, just above Cape Sable. And actually not much of that water actually went into Florida Bay as it was intended to reduce the salinity in the Bay. It came down to the middle and lower Florida Keys. And we just saw a massive, almost immediate response 
uh, to macroalgae blooms. And here uh, is a photo of Mark and Diana Littler at the Rock Pile Reef, just north of the Content Keys, with this uh, really extensive Clodophora bloom. And uh, the macroalgae loved the increased flows. Uh, the corals, not so much. We lost pretty much all those uh, magnificent brain corals uh, in those years. So that was the inspiration for this uh, nutrient-mediated biotic phase shift model, whereby uh, Climax uh, turtle grass communities and oligotrophic conditions go up this nutrient continuum, become overgrown by epiphytes or macroalgae as nutrients increase. Other species of seagrasses come in that are more tolerant of lower light, higher nutrients. And then when you begin to get phytoplankton blooms, of course, light becomes limiting. Ultimately, you, you lose the seagrasses and destabilize the sediments. And this is what we saw happen in Western Florida Bay in the 90s and the turbidity in our region went way, way up. We also got to do some work uh, with Dave Tomasco in the early 90s, about 30 years ago, uh, along gradients from urbanized areas in the Florida Keys to the Outer Reef, looking at uh, thalassia shoot productivity versus seagrass epiphyte load and macroalgal biomass. And uh, no surprise here, as those two factors go up, you, you lose shoot productivity. But what's interesting, in, in the chapter 15 of the book, um, you can see that there are actually effects as low as 15 grams dry weight per square uh, meter for macroalgae. You begin to see effects, uh, negative effects on the biodiversity of uh, benthic invertebrates. And there are a lot of papers showing that range in green, which you would think is relatively low, but can have significant effects on um, the benthic community structure. Things are uh, looking better in the Florida Keys these days. Uh, we, uh, we abandoned our septic tanks. We have a new centralized wastewater treatment collection system uh, that treats to advanced waste treatment. Uh, it's got a five-stage barden foe nitrogen removal uh, process that brings nitrogen down to about one milligram per liter from roughly on average 70 to 80 milligrams per liter for uh, septic tank effluent or sewage effluent. And that goes down a deep well. So we're seeing a lot of improvements in the nearshore and canal environments uh, with those reduced loads. Well, in 2004, I began working on the west coast of Florida when uh, these red drift algae blooms began impacting the open uh, beaches. We had not seen this as Roger Johansson uh, mentioned on Monday, we had seen macroalgae blooms in Tampa Bay, but never uh, blooms like this uh, along the beaches of Southwest Florida. These were the hurricane years. There's a lot of runoff uh, in 04 from the hurricanes and more in 05 from more hurricanes. Uh, we had a massive red tide in 2005 uh, and the macroalgae went away. Uh, there was no light for them on the bottom. But once the red tide terminated uh, at the end of 05, beginning in 06, we began to see the, uh, the red drift algae blooms return. And again, that's an, another example of the oscillation between HABs, between phytoplankton and macroalgae HABs. Obviously, there's a lot of nutrients in the system, and then light becomes the limiting factor. These are the species we commonly encountered in these red drift algae blooms. Fast growing species like Agardiella, Gracilaria hypnia, things we had worked with at Harbor Branch that respond very uh, positively to increasing nutrients. I then began working um, in Sarasota Bay, uh, being invited by Mark Alderson to look at macroalgae in the bay. This was 2009 to 2011. Uh, things were actually pretty good in the Bay, but this is when we really began looking in, at these macroalgae as bioobservatories, uh, looking at their nutrient contents with respect to the nutrient status of different segments of Sarasota Bay. You can see my, um, my assistant, Jay Leveroni, the bag man over there in the lower right panel. And here are the results of that uh, nitrogen content 
in, in big Sarasota Bay in the northern reaches of the bay were, were reasonably good. In fact, we had to really hunt around to find macroalgae. But in the little Sarasota Bay in the southern reaches, you can see very high nitrogen in the macroalgae there, very low C to N ratios. And this is uh, typical of red algae when they become nitrogen limited with those high C to N ratios. You can see how they become bleached out. They lose their nitrogen rich phycobilly protein pigments and become kind of straw colored compared to the, the lush uh, red color on the bottom. So uh, you heard Dave's talk on Monday, Little Sarasota Bay is having some issues now. Uh, this is exactly what our bio observatories were telling us 10 years ago. So that was a real inspiration working with uh, Mark and, and Jay and, and the team in Sarasota Bay. And being from Harbor Branch, I thought we need to do this in the Indian River Lagoon. And that's what we did uh, beginning around 2011, 2012, right when the, uh, you know, the super bloom was taken off, we began uh, IRL wide survey. And here are the results compared to Sarasota Bay. It's really quite interesting. You can see that little Sarasota Bay, the hotspot in that study is pretty much neck and neck with the Northern IRL in terms of nitrogen content of macroalgae above uh, 2%, which is getting pretty high. Uh, they're both averaging, you know, a little over 2.2%, I think. But if we take um, the little Sarasota value out of the Sarasota Bay data set, that's uh, represented by that blue dotted line, which is around 1.5% nitrogen, which we feel is probably a, a healthy operating space for macroalgae blooms. And you can see how elevated the nitrogen is pretty much uh, everywhere in the IRL above that value, particularly the Northern IRL and Banana River, exactly where we're seeing, of course, the, uh, the center of the, uh, the HABs, the phytoplankton HABs in that system. You can see the C to N ratio, how it goes down in the Indian River Lagoon, lower than the average for Sarasota Bay, meaning these macroalgae are not as nutrient limited. We wanna keep them up there higher values where they're nutrient limited, not leaking nitrogen uh, out into the water for phytoplankton. Look at the phosphorus in the two systems, very, very similar. Clearly these, are, these blooms are being driven more by nitrogen. And you can see that in the N to P ratio, lower N to P ratios in Sarasota Bay compared to the Indian River Lagoon, particularly the northern uh, segments of the IRL, uh, the Banana River and Mosquito Lagoon having very high N to P ratios. So since I began this work long ago, um, things have changed dramatically in the world. Uh, we've more than doubled the amount of reactive nitrogen and we've lost tremendous biodiversity. Those are the two major factors uh, where we are at high risk on our planet. We are adding about 121 million tons of nitrogen a year, nine and a half million tons of phosphorus. That human N to P ratio is 28 to one compared to 16 to one for the red field ratio. And I'm just gonna close my talk now by uh, the biggest algae bloom on the planet, the, uh, the blooms we're seeing of sargassum fluitans and natans, the great Atlantic sargassum belt that now extends almost annually from the west coast of Africa, across the tropical Atlantic, through the Caribbean, up into the Gulf of Mexico. And you can see um, these are having just catastrophic effects on the Caribbean region. We got to study these back in the 80s uh, at Lou Key and other sites in the Sargasso Sea and up the Gulf Stream. We resampled them in uh, after 2010, after the Deepwater Horizon, the uh, green squares are the more recent data. And just to uh, show you what's happening with sargassum, the carbon content has gone up, as has the nitrogen content by about 35%. Phosphorus has gone down, uh, and the C to N ratio has gone down, meaning it's, it's kind of less nitrogen limited, but in this case, there's a lot of variability in the data, so it wasn't significant. But look at the N to P ratio, it's gone up to 28 to one, matching that uh, anthropogenic N to P ratio. Uh, so these blooms are becoming more phosphorus limited. And uh, this is uh, on our front doorstep in Fort Pierce last July, just showing the uh, 
incredible biomass that we're seeing coming ashore now in South Florida, causing a lot of environmental, economic, and human health impacts. Just want to thank uh, Dave uh, for coming down to the Florida Keys and working with me uh, 30 years ago. He used to have a lot more hair back then, as you can see. Uh, Brad Bedford also was a big part of my program back then. And this is a uh, shot of my uh, team at Harbor Branch during the Indian River Lagoon studies. And with that, I'll just end there. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Um, everybody, um, we will probably move on to the next talk, but if you do have a question for Brian, please put it on the Menti. Um, the Menti slide should say Q&A for Brian. And um, if we answer that, we can um, have a couple. I'll, I'll pick one of the questions now, and then we'll make sure to follow up and have everyone answer your questions right. um, later. Um, there's a question, how does the potential nutrient load for macroalgae compare to the nutrient load from the watershed in Sarasota Bay and Indian River Lagoon? So I think the question is, what is the nutrient load comparison between Sarasota and Indian River Lagoon? Well, that would take uh, uh, another study. We really didn't get into that, but obviously that's, that's a great question and something we need to look at, um, create pie charts, right, for both Sarasota Bay and the Indian River Lagoon and look at how big the various sources are that are contributing to those nutrient loads. We've done a lot of work on septic tanks. Uh, there's been a lot of work on fertilizers. And I think the trend I'm seeing uh, is that um, the research is showing more and more that fertilizers are having less of an impact on say groundwater uh, nutrient levels compared to say septic tanks. Uh, and that may hold as well for stormwater runoff. These um, wastewater plumes and groundwater have very, very high concentrations of ammonia, nitrate, and phosphate. Um, and that, that's, again, what is driving these blooms, whether it's in, in stormwater or, or, say, groundwater plumes coming out. Um, and, um, of course, the atmospheric inputs can be significant in some cases, too. Sure. Um, can you, thank you, Brian, can you um, stop sharing your screen? Great. Our next speaker, and we'll get to more questions um, hopefully um, in a little bit, but um, each speaker um, has about 20 minutes. Um, but if, if you do want to leave time for questions, um, hopefully we can answer a couple questions that come through. So our next speaker is Dr. Valerie Paul from the Smithsonian Marine Station at Fort Pierce. Um, so I think we're good with getting you to share your screen. Hey, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yep, sounds Let's good. See. Share screen. Now it's not functioning. Of course it worked great earlier. <laughs> Did you check, just click the big green share screen button? That's what I'm doing. And then it let's probably makes see. you- There we go. Okay. Yay. There we yep. got it. And let me put it on presentation mode so you can all see it. Okay. Looks good. Go back. Okay, so uh, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about uh, the benthic cyanobacteria. Uh, Brian, I mean, uh, Dennis alluded to them a bit on his Macroalgae 101 uh, lecture on Monday, if you recall that. And um, they're functionally very much like uh, our macroalgae. They can form uh, large mats and blooms and various tufts and things. And so um, even though they're very, very different organisms, they're prokaryotic, like Dennis told us, uh, they can, can be troublesome bloom formers as well as the macroalgae. Now, when we think about cyanobacteria that often conjures up these kinds of images, these are pictures from the St. Lucie estuary and some of the big blooms we've had over the last decade, uh, a couple other images. And, uh, yeah, certainly these have gotten a, a lot of headlines and attention, but we've had some of the benthic blooms as well here in Florida. And um, just like other macroalgal blooms, like uh, uh, Brian just told us about, they're occurring on a global scale. Uh, these pictures come from all over the world. The top middle one is from uh, Florida. It's, uh, some of these mats growing in our seagrass beds. 
but other images on here are from Hawaii and uh, Australia and other places, including that big warning sign at the bottom, which is from some beach in Australia. So uh, we can see that these things, just like other uh, bloom formers, are, are troublesome around the world. Um, so my story starts uh, in Guam, actually, where I first started working on these benthic cyanobacteria. I was a faculty member at the University of Guam Marine Laboratory uh, for about 17 years before coming to Florida. And that's where I really first got started working on these. And the diversity and the um, forms are beautiful. Uh, some people might not consider them beautiful, but they're, they're pretty cool organisms. They've been around on the planet for 3 billion years. And they've, uh, cyanobacteria have you know, largely formed their oxygen environment that makes uh, life as we know it possible. Um, but these filamentous forms are a little bit different than the, the planktonic uh, types. And they often form these hair-like mats. And you can see the microscopic image. Um, to me, I kind of describe these as, uh, uh, think of a, a roll of coins where you have all the little coins stacked up and those are like the cells of the cyanobacterium and they're inside a sheath, like the coin holder, uh, which is a polysaccharide sheath. And you can kind of see that, I don't know if my cursor works here, you can kind of see that polysaccharide sheath here as like a transparent covering over the filaments. Uh, some of them are really cool. This is harmothamnion. We get this in Florida and it can bloom uh, pretty extensively sometimes down in the Keys. It's really olive green, kind of snotty looking stuff. Uh, but this is a, um, a, one of the nitrogen fixers. And you can see these uh, specialized cells here in the filaments are the heterocysts, uh, cells where nitrogen fixation occurs. Some cyanobacteria do not have those specialized cells and can still fix nitrogen. But this one is a really good example of that specialization for nitrogen fixation. So in Guam, I did a lot of work on chemical defenses of seaweeds. For those of you that don't know me, I do a lot of work in chemical ecology. Uh, and we did all kinds of feeding experiments and other things uh, with the macroalgae as well as the cyanobacteria and plenty of other organisms as well. Um, and really can kind of generalize that at least in the tropical systems and on, in reef habitats that uh, most of the macroalgae or cyanobacteria you see are uh, protected from herbivores often by chemical defenses. And I'll come back to that a couple of times during my talk. So I came to Florida in 2002. Uh, so it's been almost 19 years. And our field station, the Smithsonian Marine Station, which is in Fort Pierce, not very far from Harbor Branch, also manages a little field station down in Belize, on Kerry Bow Key. Uh, and uh, this is a, a really cool place to do some um, tropical work. And I've got a few pictures from there as well. But, most of the, many of the species that occur uh, on reefs in the Caribbean also occur on reefs here in Florida. So we see a lot of that same diversity. So when I first came to Florida, I'm not quite sure how uh, people first learned that I was interested in the cyanobacteria, perhaps because I'd given a couple lectures and things on our work in Guam, but I got contacted by Ken Banks at Broward County. Many of you probably know him. And they were having some really uh, amazing blooms of cyanobacteria down there in uh, Broward County at this time. This was the early 2000s, uh, 2002, uh, 2003. And you can see this, this reddish hair-like stuff growing all over the bottom. And you can see the uh, filamentous um, form of the cyanobacterium here in the image, the microscopic image. And uh, these were just really impressive. They were overgrowing everything. And so we got lots of material we could study and work with. Um, since then, and those blooms persisted for several years, winter and summer, and eventually went away uh, after the big hurricanes in 2004, 2005, they sort of dispersed. So we've since looked at these filamentous cyanobacteria all around um, South Florida, and here are just a few images. These floating uh, mats are really common in the summer months. And you can see that, um, you know, we've sampled all over the place, although we have not really sampled very far further north in Florida. And it would be really interesting to see how um, some of these species are dispersing and potentially moving northward as our uh, water temperatures warm up. Uh, they are very much associated with warmer water temperatures. Usually it, around 24 uh, C is kind of a, a cutoff, if you will, of when you might start seeding these blooms. I really like this image that Hans Perl and his uh, colleague worked up uh, when we were working on some of these um, 
blooms down in, in the Fort Lauderdale area. And I think it summarizes nicely. I mean, we've talked about all these macroalgae and of course they all respond to nutrients, um, but cyanobacteria are particularly um, uh, prone to, uh, to bloom with warming water temperatures and that uh, water temperature can really control their proliferation. Mm -hmm. uh, they also uh, use these trace elements like iron that we haven't talked that much about and iron is really important for the nitrogenase enzyme, the enzyme that fixes nitrogen. So there are a few other um, nutrient dynamics at play here that we haven't uh, talked quite as much about with the macroalgae. The other thing is the toxins they produce, which can deter grazing. So you have little top-down control on these blooms. Uh, this is just an example from the Indian River Lagoon where we monitored pretty closely four sites for some of these map uh, forming uh, bloomers during summer. And what's notable here is there's no, uh, there's not, not a lot of pattern. I mean, obviously they start off in the spring when you'll, you'll see some of these blooms occur. And then each site was almost pulsing at a different uh, pace. And you can see that the percent cover of the bottom got to as high as like almost 100%. So these can form some pretty extensive mats in some cases. We've also looked at some experimental studies. This is with a colleague, Chris Langdon, uh, expert in ocean acidification at uh, Rosensteel School, University of Miami, growing them at a bunch of different environmental conditions. Uh, across the bottom, you'll see the temperature, and then the next number is the um, partial pressure of CO2. So we went way up on PCO2, and uh, the bottom line here is these things just grow no matter what you do. All of these uh, numbers are not statistically different from one another. And uh, it almost doesn't matter what environmental conditions you throw at them, as long as the water's warm enough, they're gonna bloom. And so this is a uh, challenge for managing these cyanobacteria. The other thing are the compounds they produce. They produce nitrogenous compounds, uh, cyclic peptides, uh, depsy peptides, which are uh, both uh, amino acid derived as well as fatty acid derived. And this is a, a example of a protease inhibitor that we got from these mats in, in uh, uh, Broward County. And very, uh, very typical of the kinds of compounds we'll see in cyanobacteria, not only these marine ones, but also, uh, for instance, the microcystins in uh, microcystis. And uh, we've exploited these a bit, uh, working with a colleague at University of Florida, Hendrik Lusch, who I first started working with uh, in Guam, uh, we've worked together for about 20 years now. We have uh, pulled compounds from these cyanobacteria here in Florida. Um, this Largozole came from Key Largo. It's a really important, uh, very interesting uh, histone deacetylase inhibitor. So uh, we've been working with these with uh, National Cancer Institute funds for the last few years, uh, last 15 years, I guess, uh, as well for um, possible uh, biomedical compounds. The compounds also play a role in feeding deterrence, as I mentioned, and we've tested these with a lot of different grazers and use, uh, we use uh, feeding assays where we can embed the actual compounds or the extracts and see if grazers, uh, you know, show preference for one, uh, for control food or uh, control food or treated food and uh, really determine that these can inhibit grazing uh, activity except by some of the specialists, like these little sea hares, Stylochylus, which will uh, preferentially eat some of the compounds. So I wanna uh, talk a little bit about some of the um, taxonomic work that we've done. And a lot of this uh, attribute to um, Nicholas Enhene, who was a postdoctoral researcher in my laboratory, but also uh, went on to uh, be a faculty member at Florida International University for a few years. He's now back in Europe, but um, he was really interested in trying to uh, detangle some of, the, uh, some of the complexity of the um, taxonomy of these things. And you heard uh, both um, Dennis and other people yesterday allude to the fact that these were all called lingvia at one time, these, a lot of these filamentous mats or oscillatoria. And we now appreciate that the diversity is much greater than that. And unfortunately, it takes uh, molecular me me uh, methods and to some extent, some of these chemical methods to uh, uh, disentangle this complexity. Uh, this is just some uh, one portion of just a, you know, just a small representation of the diversity of the cyanobacteria. But with uh, Nicholas's help, we described, um, well, he described as part of his PhD, this uh, genus Morena, uh, 
Uh, but we looked at Caldora, Oceania, Dapis, and um, this is the oscillatoria that we already know. Others, uh, Dale Laughinghouse, who I believe is on the um, workshop this morning, has been continuing to try and disentangle some of this complexity. And he's uh, been working uh, over in this part of the, of the tree, uh, um, as far as I know, trying to uh, describe some new biodiversity as well. So the complexity is tremendous and we only barely know what's going on. But one really interesting point, and we got, uh, got to this really well when we were uh, working on the genus Oceania, is that each species is producing its own suite of compounds. So this is um, pretty cool and can be, these can be phylogenetic markers for uh, some of these species as well. And in some ways it's easier to run a quick LCMS trace than it is to uh, do some of the molecular work that's necessary to say, say what these are. So for instance, if we uh, collected this and uh, found this uh, dolostatin um, 12 compound in it, we'd be pretty convinced that we were working with Oceania plumata. Uh, Caldor is a really cool one, one of my favorites. I just have to show you these pictures because I love this stuff. And it's all very abundant in the keys. Produces some of the most toxic compounds imaginable. Um, these dolostatin 10 uh, type compounds, some derivatives of these are actually currently being used as anti-cancer drugs in um, uh, chemotherapy with interesting uh, um, means of delivery as antib antibody drug conjugates. I wanna show you this one, DAPIS is really important because it forms these floating mats that we see in our estuaries in the summer. I think this was mentioned briefly yesterday and can grow all over our seagrass beds. This one is the one that we uh, documented at like 100% cover at certain times. But DAP the genus DAPIS is all over the Caribbean and can, uh, in some cases, you know, we're, we're seeing cases where it can just overgrow and some other reefs as well. These are interesting, some work out of Curacao shows that uh, organic carbon can also fuel some of these blooms. Uh, I just have to show you black band disease. This is a cyanobac another cyanobacterial mat, uh, believe it or not, dominated by Roseophyllum reptitanium that can kill corals. And it's, uh, it's found all over the world. Um, very, very interesting how these uh, black layers of cyanobacteria will destroy the coral tissue. And so this uh, band would march across the coral in, in this direction, leaving the dead skeleton behind, um, likely getting its nutrient, uh, nutrient uh, needs as it goes by the, the decaying coral tissue. Um, this one uh, we've studied from around the world and um, pulled out these compounds that we described a couple of years ago, which we named the leukeolides because so many of our collections came from leuke where black band disease was pretty common. So I just want to come back to my, um, use this as my summary slide, if you will, because there are a lot of things going on with these blooms. Uh, warming temperatures will fuel them, certainly nutrient enrichment, like we've talked about for all of the macroalgae and um, these trace uh, trace elements that we didn't talk too much about, but the toxins play a role here and they can in some of the macroalgae too. Not, not a lot of those uh, reds like Brian was just talking about, but for instance, Calerpa, the whole genus Calerpa um, produces terpenes, which are uh, really interesting and can, um, can deter grazers as well. So there are a lot of interesting things going on with top-down control that we often don't talk about. Uh, or, or lack thereof of top-down control because of the, um, the deterrence that these, uh, that these algae and cyanobacteria are producing. So I just want to acknowledge a lot of people. My colleague Kendra Kluge is, is here. Uh, we've worked a lot on uh, the biomedical aspects of, of, this, of these compounds and uh, just a lot of people in my lab who've contributed over the years to collecting and extracting and studying cyanobacteria and different funding sources that have uh, helped support some of this work. So thank you. Thank you, Valerie, that was great. Um, so we have um, the Menti um, meter is up and going. If you would like to put your questions in there, um, we actually have a question in the chat. Will nitrogen fixtures continue to pull nitrogen from the atmosphere to eutrophy our estuaries in relation to excess phosphorus? 
If so, what trophic impacts would we expect to see if upland management efforts were to advance phosphorus removals more quickly than nitrogen reductions, forcing the N to P ratios up? And I don't know if you can see that chat um, question, if it's easier. Yeah. But, um, yeah. yeah, it's an interesting question. So, so nitrogen, so not all cyanobacteria fix nitrogen, right? So like microcystis doesn't really, and that's one of our most troublesome um, bloomers in the freshwater environment in, in Lake Okeechobee and sometimes in the estuaries. Uh, so, so it's, you can't really group all cyanobacteria together. Uh, I think it's a misnomer to think that phosphorus reductions are the only things that's going to control uh, cyanobacteria. They they will use nitrogen from the and and even the nitrogen fixers will use nitrogen and they can take organic nitrogen as well. So like urea compounds and dissolved carbon and all sorts of things uh, to fuel these blooms. So it's really it's a got to be a, a full on nutrient control uh, to to even try to um, influence their, their capacity to bloom. So for the nitrogen fixers, which, is, which are some of these filamentous forms, they, they, can, they can continue to pull nitrogen from the environment. Um, and so phosphorus become, can become more limiting for them. But for others, uh, both nitrogen and phosphorus for like DAPIS and some of these, they'll take up both. And uh, so it, it has to be a, dual nutrient control that um, it, it is utilized to try to control their abundance. Okay, thanks. I don't know if you can see the questions on the menti.com slide. Yes, I can. I, would you like to pick a question? Uh, what might be the impact of secondary compounds on manatee grazing? That's an interesting one as, as seagrasses diminish and they have to switch to different algae. A couple that concern me uh, and, you know, of course there's no way to to really do experimental work with this uh, is calerpa. I don't know if they eat it. I guess we would know from some of the stomach content work. Uh, and some of the reds that produce uh, cyanic acid, which is somewhat related, to, somewhat similar to domoic acid and can have some uh, neurological effects. That one con concerns me a bit as well. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think we know, but, but again, as their diet is being as they're being forced to switch their diet because there's so much less seagrass, um, we do know that they do eat more, more macroalgae. And I'm not sure that, that um, you know, how, how good a food source some of those are. Um, in Southwestern Florida, we've seen blooms of algae followed by blooms of sea hares. Uh, yes, that's a really cool thing. And uh, that's been described a lot of places. In fact, the sea hares will, um, will eat the, the cyanobacteria or algae, uh, depending on uh, some of the red algae can also be eaten by uh, sea hares, different species of sea hares. Um, <clears throat> and yes, they can feed on toxic compounds. They can handle them. They can actually use them, sequester them and use them for their own defense. And their abundance can just go crazy when, they're, when they have a, a big supply of these. And then of course they'll eventually die out if the algae dies out. So for, for folks like me that don't know what sea hares are, are those some kind of zooplankton or fish? Sorry, I'm sorry. I did have one picture of them. They are epistobranch mollusks. Um, okay. without, well, they have a very, some of them have a very thin internal shell, but they don't look shelled. Uh, they look like slug, sea slugs, basically. Um, okay. And they are very, very cool uh, organisms that can handle toxic algae. Gotcha. Okay, well, there's one more question if you want to answer it while I'm going to switch over to um, the next speaker. You see the one? So, I think those, the best. yeah, the management strategies. I guess I, I probably didn't say this very conclusively. Uh, and so I'll say it now. I mean, these things are hard to manage, right? They, cyanobacteria have been around for 3 billion years. Every time the environment gets more degraded, their abundances go up. Uh, they've, met, they've made it through every major extinction event on the planet without um, much impact on their abundance. And so man management strategies, and I think David Tomasco said this well yesterday, I mean, there's only so much we can do. Uh, I mean, obviously, collectively as a society, cl uh, warm climate change is something we need to address. But as a manager, 
there's only so much you can do about that. So that means doubling down on these nutrient reduction strategies because that's the end and the hydrology, because those are the things that we can manage. And we don't know very much about the synergistic or additive or interactive effects of climate change and nutrients on cyanobacteria, but I would expect that they are going to take advantage of all of that and just uh, continue to bloom and proliferate. And it's a very, very challenging situation. Um, the best management strategies are to, you know, really to double down on some of these nutrient reduction uh, strategies. Uh, sounds good. Yeah, that's very common um, throughout most coastal ecosystems is we know climate change is going to affect these things. So we need to make sure that we're doing the best we can with the, the things that we are currently trying to manage like nutrients and, and uh, water flow. All right. Well, thank you so much. Really interesting talk. Um, so next we have uh, Dr. Eric Milbrandt from Santa Bal Captiva Conservation Foundation. Um, so Eric, you want to go ahead and yep. And you're still muted. Thank you. Um, we've got a full screen here. Looks good. Whoops, on my last slide. Wait a second. There we go. Could start at the back, but it probably makes more sense to start from the beginning. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you uh, for inviting me to talk about one of my favorite subjects. Um, and um, Mainly, most of my talk is, is focused on uh, the lower Charlotte because we've seen in Ding Darling um, and initially identified them as Briopsis, but um, we also discovered um, a, abundance of the Sacoglossum and gastropod oxyno, which, you know, took us a, a little while to figure that out. And we spoke to some experts in California and they confirmed that, that they're only associated with, with Calerpa. So we went back and um, looked look through our, our guidebooks and, and it appeared that the morphology and the presence of rhizomes were consistent with, uh, with the Calerpa fastigiata. Um, so it, it does form very dense mats. There's often rhizoclonium and other green algae um, intermixed with it. Uh, but the, uh, the, the oxyno are proliferating in, in these, um, in these calerpa mats. So um, Brian mentioned the, the um, drift macroalgae, they uh, typically macroalgae attach uh, to something with rhizoids or holdfasts and they, um, they, they, in this part of Florida, they seem to proliferate once they are broken loose. Um, and then they undergo changes in morphology with increased branching and they often continue to grow with no uh, adverse effects. And um, what you end up with are large um, accumulations uh, of it um, on the beaches when conditions are favorable, um, i.e. high light and high nitrogen. So just because I was asked to um, talk about drivers a little bit, um, I thought this comparison was rather helpful, um, comparing deep water estuaries like the Chesapeake Bay, which are phytoplankton, um, mostly pr production driven, whereas the shallow photic ecosystems are mostly a production is driven by SAVs and uh, macroalgae. And um, there's, we're obviously in the shallow photic uh, systems, and instead of being driven mostly by river flow, there's uh, more groundwater interaction as far as um, that nutrient load. So over a two year period, um, starting in 2008, after the large uh, scale microalgae blooms were occurring on our beaches, um, we started a investigation, just a distribution and abundance of a variety at a variety of sites in the Gulf of Mexico and in Pine Island Sound. Um, and we found there were uh, differences in the community composition as you might expect between the Gulf of Mexico uh, communities and uh, the, the Pine Island Sound communities. Um, 
The Gulf uh, was driven mostly by Bacteriocladia, Solaria, um, and their peak biomass occurred um, more during the summer months, at least during the period of time when we are studying them. And in contrast, the sound um, communities were driven mostly by Grassleria tigbahi, um, Sargassum filipendula, and some others that have, have been mentioned. And their peak period seemed to be more occurring in the winter months. So we had another study um, that was very brief. It was during one year where we were getting a lot of reports from fishing guides and from um, paddleboard um, guides that there was a lot of macroalgae occurring in San Carlos Bay near the San Car uh, Sanibel Causeway. Um, so we undertook a Charles study following uh, Roger Johansson's work in Tampa Bay um, and, and wanted to really look at a gradient um, of distance from the mouth of the Caloosahatchee River where our presumed source of, of of loading was occurring versus further away and in, in the Darling National Wildlife Refuge on San Bum. So what we found um, was, again, this is just a snapshot, so it, it doesn't really, um, um, it doesn't lead, lead to a really strong conclusions. but what it told us is that there was a gradient of higher macroalgae biomass occurring uh, closer to the Caloosahatchee, um, although there were several interesting back bay areas in Ding Darling that seem to be warmer temperatures and um, higher residence time potentially, where um, you'd have huge accumulations of things like spiridia and hypnia. And one of those, um, you know, some of those hot spots got, got us thinking more about um, the interaction, not only with the loads from the Caloosahatchee, um, which I'll show you a slide in a minute, um, but also local sources of, of, of groundwater interaction potentially. Um, when we looked at the isotopic values of, of some of the algae from the, the two-year study, um, you know, um, we did see enriched uh, delta N uh, N15 in a lot of the sound um, samples that we collected and actually all the species that we found, um, sort of suggesting that there was um, more of a, a, a sewer type signal. And um, Brian LaPointe in, in his publication uh, also found that that gel N15 was in, enriched and, and it changed between the wet season, it was higher and drier, uh, or sorry, higher in the, in the dry season and decreased in the wet season. And that was maybe a signal that there was a shift in the, in the sources. So um, I'm just going to skip that slide. We, we've undergone not as, very, not as nice uh, experiments that Brian showed at, at Harbor Ranch, but still um, some nitrogen um, uh, enrichment experiments, nitrate specifically, looking at um, growth of several species in the lab. Uh, once they fragmented, they seem to do very well under uh, high nitrate uh, conditions, um, significantly better than the, than the controls. So during the, the two-year study, we um, were collaborating with uh, Matt Charette from Woods Hole, and he is an expert in, um, in groundwater tracing and um, was finding very high um, groundwater fluxes um, in, in the dry period. And um, some of his data is, is, is shown here. Um, the main thing I wanted to, to highlight is the, the um, fluxes com comparing the submarine groundwater discharge to the discharge at the Franklin Lock, which is the Caloosahatchee uh, fluxes. And that in general, the Franklin Lock was higher most of the time, uh, but occasionally during the dry period, you would have really high uh, submarine groundwater uh, uh, load-in rates. So this was summarized in a table um, by Mike Parsons, I think Lowe, Wynne Everham, and others um, in a summary of, of sources of nitrogen. And this is um, a summary from around 2010, so it's a little bit old now. Um, but I wanted to just show you um, some of the, the groundwater estimates during the dry period were almost 
um, were more than twice as high as, as the, the total um, nitrogen and total phosphorus fluxes coming from, from S79. Um, during the wet period, of course, S79 is, is uh, the Caloosahatchee is dominating. Um, so on an annual basis, um, I think the, the groundwater component is more uh, important than maybe we estimated previously to this, uh, to this estimation, but we still don't know a lot um, ab about those, those fluxes. So it's likely there's a combination of, um, <clears throat> of river uh, loading, which is very high uh, from the Caloosahatchee and, and uh, groundwater interactions. So one thing that um, we've kind of talked about a little bit too is, is recurring red tide. And um, we know that it wipes out a certain amount of, of the fish populations in an area. Um, we've been having consistent recurring red tides um, since 2017. Um, and uh, don't really need to probably share this with, with, we've heard a lot about it, but in the Caribbean, um, overfishing um, has led to a decrease in, in coral cover and increase in macroalgae. And in a sense, um, if you want to think of it that way, the red tide, recurring red tide, um, is similar to a, <clears throat> an overfishing effect. And in this uh, conceptual uh, model of, uh, by Burkholder et al., um, we just modified it to, to add the recurring red tide. And, and essentially what you're what you're moving towards is a, is a higher um, algal biomass and a lower sea, seagrass biomass with a lot of interactions with um, small predators and, and mesograzers. So finally, the, um, this uh, figure from Valiella et al. in 1997 um, shows this progression of nutrient loading um, and the loss of seagrass, the proliferation of of macroalgae to eventually uh, maybe total loss of benthic production to uh, exclusively phytoplankton production at really high nitrogen loads. And I just want to, I wanted to um, show you where the Caloosahatchee was and the St. Lucie estuary in, in relation to, to this figure. Um, and, and it seems like we may be still on the seagrass favorable side of this, but as um, water temperatures get warmer and we maybe get some benefits from uh, Everglades uh, storage and, and treatment of water, um, we may be able to move that line um, one way or another. So my summary, um, we had differences in, in peak abundances, which I think are, are important in considering um, how to manage uh, some of the blooms that perhaps the, the Lag effect from the Caloosahatchee during, um, uh, which is a major source of TN is, is relevant here, at least in the sound that they're, they're growing during the winter months when the water is clear, um, salinities are higher. Um, some of our worst, worst beach, beach stranding events are during the summer when you have really high uh, DO consumption and you can actually get um, hypoxic zones in the swash zone because there's there, there are accumulations of algae and they produce heat like a composting pile and um, just use up dissolved oxygen very quickly. And um, the recurring uh, red tide blooms um, do have top-down effects. We don't really understand them very well, um, but they likely influence the, the nutrient cycling of the algae that's there. Um, and if it's allowed to become huge, uh, a huge part of, of the biomass, then um, all that just gets cycled in the system. So uh, with that, I will um, gladly take some questions. I'm gonna stop sharing and thank you very much. Great, um, really great talk again. And so I'm just really excited by all, all these, all these uh, really interesting, um, Talks. I had a couple questions, but I'll wait. And um, can you see the mentee, or do you want me to answer? Uh, ask yeah, um, I can see them. Um, so there's a question about um, repeated wastewater spills. I, I'm assuming that is, um, you know, during after Irma, especially we had 
um, widespread power outages and <clears throat> lift stations that were um, over, overflowed with water and, and some, some spills. And, and I believe that um, those sources of uh, inorganic nutrients and, and ammonium and, and nitrate um, likely did have uh, a contribution to the abundance of macroalgae, but it's difficult to connect that um, where those, those are occurring, whether it's along the Kusahashi estuary or where we mostly were looking is down near the Sanibel Causeway area. And um, our wastewater treatment plant on Sanibel does um, have ponds and um, use reuse uh, management strategies, but they also uh, inject. So um, what do I, where, what do I think the sources for the high submarine groundwater nutrient loading rate um, and why would it be more in the dry season than wet? I think um, it's just a matter of the, hydro the hydrology of this area is very porous. Um, you have in the summer, you know, higher water levels everywhere. And as it stops raining, those, those, wet, those wet areas pump groundwater um, out and, and discharge it. Um, and, and I guess that's, that's why I would have to consult more with Matt Charette on, on that. I'm not a, really a groundwater expert, but it seemed to be very, um, uh, there, there are some important data in that, in that paper um, about this, this region. Um, if you looked at DIN loads, would groundwater be more important than CR flows um, than is the case with TN loads? Possibly, but you know, DIN is going to be used very quickly, um, and and then it's a matter of recycling downstream. So, probably um, the the TN loads are more of an, an indicator of, of the total nitrogen, of course, um, and that that's coming into the system. But the loads are are um, clearly important from from all the research that we that we have on on the relationship between primary producers and, and macroalgae and, and nitrogen. Um, that's an interesting question. Do I think the uh, seasonal residents might affect the increased dry season loading? Um, I, I wouldn't say the seasonal residents, but certainly during the dry season, uh, wastewater treatment plants that are allowed to discharge to the Coosahatchee, which I know there's some um, changes to that. They're planning on, on not discharging to the Coosahatchee, but those loads relative to loads from say, S79 are relatively higher um, because the river flows are low and the, the wastewater treatment plants are, are at capacity a lot of times. So, um, so yeah, okay. thanks for all the great questions. I, I wish I was more of a, uh, a nutrient hydro uh, modeler person to be able to answer those better. But. Um, yeah, I'm sure there'll be a lot of good discussions in the breakout groups as well as um, during the panel. Um, tomorrow. Uh, so we are actually going to a break now. And um, it's it's 1015. We actually want to come back at uh, 1025. So we're really going to take a 10 minute break. Um, so get up, stretch your legs, get some water, um, check those emails, that kind of thing. And uh, I'll update the slide, but um, back at uh, 1025 for our next talk. Eric, you're still unmuted. I don't know if you want me to mute you or. Thanks. <laughs> 
All right, everybody, we're going to get started in about a minute. So um, let me know if anybody has any questions before then. <clears throat> Okay, 11, uh, 1025, and we're going to get started. So our next um, speaker is Betty Stogler from Florida Sea Grant, Charlotte County. Uh, so you should be able to take it away, Betty. Assuming everyone can see this. Yes, looks good and we can hear you. Great, thank you. So um, before I get started, I, I just wanna say that the, the talks this far have been absolutely fantastic and I'm, I'm really learning a lot. So I really appreciate um, the information. Um, today, what I'm gonna talk about is a citizen science monitoring program that I started in Charlotte Harbor to address some of the macroalgae concerns that we've been seeing as well as some of the lessons that we've learned and, and where we're headed into the future. So I just kind of gave away my outline. I'll move on to the next slide. And I, I don't really think I have to go into great detail on why we started this macroalgae project. There's roughly 170 people on the Zoom. And so it kind of demonstrates that macroalgae is a concern for um, for a lot of people, and it certainly is in Charlotte Harbor for both citizens and non, or for both citizens and scientists. And um, if you listen to Nicole's talk on Monday, um, you know that we really rely a lot on our citizens as eyes on the harbor. They're particularly our, our recreational and commercial fishermen. They're out on the water a lot. They see changes and they um, they let us know. And um, we really, as Nicole mentioned, haven't, you know, we, we've considered ourselves a pretty healthy estuary. And so I think maybe we got caught off guard a little bit. And so we really haven't had the infrastructure in place to look comprehensively at macroalgae. And a lot of our focus has been on uh, the water column and the monitoring programs that are in place that do collect macroalgae information kind of do so as a secondary to something else. So seagrass primary macroalgae while we're out there or um, fisheries primary, but we're describing habitats. And so this project was really just developed to put macroalgae at the forefront and it also collects seagrass information because seagrass is, is what we value. So um, in putting together the monitoring program, um, again, it's, it's based on looking at macroalgae in shallow water areas, but these were the data gaps that we really wanted to address. What's the temporal and spatial dist distribution? Are there hotspot areas? And is there a sequence in the bloom forming species? So the, the volunteer program, um, volunteers monitor twice a year in April and in July. The project was started in 2019 and I'll spoiler alert to let you know that in 2020 COVID completely shut us down. So we, um, we only have information for 2019, but we are ready to go for 2021. Um, as far as the location, Right now, we only have data for Upper Charlotte Harbor. We'll be expanding to Lemon Bay this year. But um, the sites were randomly selected and this was to reduce volunteer bias um, in selecting sites. And at the sites, the volunteers are deploying 50 meter transects perpendicular to shore. And then they are 
placing a quadrat, a half meter quadrat down every 10 meters from zero to the 50 meter mark. So six um, survey locations total. And this is what it looks like on the bottom right. Um, I actually give them transects in a bucket. Um, it's made up of sink line and um, there's weights at each end of the 50 meter line. And then there's additional line with floats attached so that they can see their transect from the surface. With, within um, each of the half meter quadrats, this is the information that they are collecting. And you can see it's pretty standard information that you would collect if you were doing seagrass um, transect surveys. Additionally, for the macroalgae specific um, data, they are um, collecting all of the macroalgae that they encounter when they do their 20 meter quadrat. And the 20 meter quadrat just standardizes um, that actual collection. It's not significant of anything. But um, normally we tell them when they put the quadrat down to do their macroalgae abundance first and then move the macroalgae off the quadrat so that they can expose the seagrass underneath to do the seagrass um, survey portion, but here we tell them instead to collect everything, put it in a bucket, bring it back to the boat. And then once they do that, they will spin their macroalgae down for 60 seconds. They separate by those color phylums that we've talked about, the greens, the browns, and the reds. Remove anything that's not macroalgae, and typically we see like seagrass blades or snails. And then they um, bag way with a spring scale and store on ice. And then those samples come back to me for species ID. And I'm going to put it right out there. I am not a phycologist. Um, so I, I, I do wanna thank our partners, um, particularly Eric Milbrandt who just spoke for helping with some of those species IDs. So this is what the first year's data looks like. Um, on the left, E1, E2, E3, this is the east wall of Charlotte Harbor. U1, U2 is upper Charlotte Harbor around the rivers and W3, W4 is the western side of Charlotte Harbor. And you can see if you look on that eastern side of Charlotte Harbor, we had a pretty significant macroalgae bloom um, relative to the seagrass in both spring and In terms of the macroalgae wet weight, um, you can see that the bloom really kind of started in E2 and E2 is, it's, it's not one specific station, it's a cluster of four stations. So all of these are, are clusters of multiple stations and these are average um, grams. The spring bloom was identified as catamorpha. However, by summer, the bloom had expanded out north and south, but was dominated by Gervasia. And this was um, surprising to us because we had not had a bloom like this on the east wall of Charlotte Harbor. We'd seen some green filamentous blooms on the western side of Charlotte Harbor and in other locations outside of the study area but um, we hadn't seen anything like this um, on the east side, or at least it hadn't been documented. So here's a look at that bloom location. The red circle uh, is that E2, and um, the two top stations were really what, where the bloom was centralized in April and then it had expanded north and south, um, which is outside of this map. It really does continue beyond the red um, by July. And in the same location, you can see, and this probably is not surprising, that we had less epibionts in the summer looking at the density that was on top of the seagrass, that really wasn't surprising. And I'll just point out this little asterisk um, in the spring in E3. 
in the spring, um, the volunteers did not note any seagrass in those locations. And so obviously there was no lot of be buyouts. So in January of 2020, we were gearing up to do our next round of eyes on seagrass. We were still getting reports of the bloom and that it had potentially expanded even further. And so the map that you see on the left is some ground reconnaissance that I did with the folks from the FWC FIM program and the FDEP Charles Harbor Aquatic Reserves. And you can see that we, we really did have a pretty significant bloom. This is about 20 miles of Charlotte Harbor's eastern shoreline. And at that time, when we sent samples off, they were identified as Calerpa fastigata, which um, Eric mentioned early in his talk. I did mention that we were not able to uh, monitor in 2020. However, by March, we were starting to get reports that the bloom was decomposing, it was floating to the surface, creating these gnarly um, mats, and um, that's what you see in the inset picture. And so we, we kind of breathed a sigh of relief. We thought, you know, things, things are settling out and um, it's going to be, you know, back to normal after this. And then we started getting reports in December of 2020 that the bloom was back in full force. So this is another reconnaissance that we did in January 2021. Same group plus Chris Anastasio from Swift Mud. And um, we also noted that it's very significant in these back bay tributaries, which we did not go into in 2020. So, you know, a lot of people ask what is causing that bloom and, and really we, we don't know. I think Eric um, summarized some of the potential causes really, really well in his talk. Certainly, you know, Hurricane Irma hit in 2017, came up along the eastern shore or the eastern side of Charlotte Harbor, dumped a lot of water into the estuary from, from the um, rains that occurred after that. And um, we know that particularly Upper Charlotte Harbor is very freshwater dominated um, through its three river systems and the relative importance of those rivers in contributing freshwater um, is shown, well, particularly for the Peace and the Caloosahatchee in the middle inset, which is a new um, publication from researchers at FGCU. These are buoyant particles that were released and it shows the movement over 20 days. And you can see during the wet season, um, the Caloosahatchee has a pretty strong influence on that eastern side, whereas in the dry season, um, it's more dominated by freshwater from the northern um, rivers. And this doesn't even account for sheet flow off the land or groundwater, which Eric mentioned as being particularly important. And then of course we had the significant um, red tide blooms in 2017 that lasted through 2019 and then a subsequent one um, after that. So were these contributing factors? Possibly, but you know, ultimately we don't know. And I think we need to also keep in mind that we started this program because there was concern. So these may have been episodic events that caused that is causing this east wall bloom, but we still have issues. We still have macroalgae blooms. And so we can't just assume that it's these big events and then everything's hunky-dory. We still have issues. We still have too many nutrients that are coming from somewhere. So that led to a lot of um, questions and I'll call them data gaps. And um, certainly with a volunteer program, when we're, we're dealing with citizen scientists, we can't expect them to answer all of these questions. I would lose them um, in droves, but um, we did pick what we think we can manage with um, a citizen science program. And so this year in 2021, we are going to be adding sediment samples and doing some additional macroalgae analysis 
Thanks to my colleagues, Ashley Smith and Dale Laffinghouse from the University of Florida. And so we can hopefully get at some of those um, questions about nutrient pool and macroalgae. And we'll also be able to do some additional or better species ID for morphology because as Eric mentioned, species ID is really important because they are all responding to nutrients differently. We're also expanding the project to Lemon Bay and through the Sarasota Bay Estuary Program to Sarasota Bay in July. And I would, I'm hoping to be able to add some photo plots in, um, in the July survey. So I'm going to leave you with, um, I guess I would call some additional data gaps. These are things that I think down the road, we really need to answer. Um, where are those nutrient sources coming from? That's the only way we can effectively manage. And thinking about mitigation, um, I think the last bullet comes into play. Is there, are there ecosystem services where we can utilize this macroalgae? And I know this is something that Mindy's thought about a lot um, from the aquatic preserves is how do we, is, is there a use for this macroalgae? Can we get it out of the system? And if so, how do we do that without destroying the, you know, what's left of the seagrass underneath? So that's all I have. And I will thank you very much and answer any questions. Thanks, Betty. Um, I, I, we were having a little bit of audio trouble there on and off, but I, I do believe that the talk was very clear and um, we have it recorded too in case people want to review it. But um, great, great presentation. I'm going to switch over to my, um, the Mentimeter questions. Um, can you see that one? I can. So the question is, do we have some insight into what conditions might favor blooms of these green filamentous algae as opposed to the red algae or cyanobacteria? And I don't, um, you know, historically we have had more, you know, Charlotte Harbor has seen more red algae. And I think that's has a lot to do with the, the darker estuary to begin with and that um, freshwater dominated um, the, the tannins. But um, again, I'm not a phycologist, so I am not sure that I can answer that question. Hopefully we can get into more details about that in the breakouts. Can I explain more how people can get involved with citizen science monitoring efforts you mentioned? Um, well, you can email me because we are recruiting at the, at the moment for our April and July monitoring for 2021. And um, I can put my email address in the chat box so that you have that. And um, I would be more than welcome to have you participate on a team. And then can you review what's happened to the seagrass in these bloom affected areas? So um, I think that is going to be a part of Chris's talk coming up next, but I can tell you that we do know that we are losing seagrass in, um, in that area. Great, thanks. Um, we have uh, an, another talk coming up. Before I do that, is, is Brian LaPointe still on the, on the meeting? We see his name, but um, if- I'm here. If Brian, if you- Oh, can you hear me okay, Brian? Yes, I can. Okay, great. We had a few folks ask that um, we give you some time to answer some of their questions from your talk. So sure. after um, after Chris is done, um, we'll, and we'll go through Chris's talk and his questions, I'll go back to your, your questions that you got from some participants, so. Sounds good. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so. Yes, Chris is up um, talking. Uh, he's from Southwest Florida Water Management District and is, um, take it away. Uh, can, can you say hello so we'll make sure we can hear you, Chris? Hey guys, can you, uh, can you all hear us okay? Yes, sounds awesome. good. 
Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's, it's great to, to be here. Thank you for the invitation to uh, share some of the stuff that we've been doing with um, looking at some of the change dynamics that we're seeing uh, throughout the Suncoast region from Tampa Bay to Charlotte Harbor. Um, I'm Chris Anastasio. I'm the uh, chief scientist in the Seagrass Mapping Program lead for the Southwest Florida Water Management District. And I'm here today uh, with my colleague, Nate uh, Morton from uh, MD5 Geospatial, uh, formerly known as Quantum Spatial, um, since we're in the same room together, hence the masks. But um, I, I'm excited about going through this because uh, what we're gonna do is not talk about seagrass maps. What we're actually gonna talk about is the imagery itself and some of the information that we hope uh, or that we're starting to get in terms of looking at successional change from seagrass to macroalgae and hopefully back to seagrass. <clears throat> but before we get into that, I did wanna just give everyone a, a quick overview of what the Water Management District has done with respect to seagrass mapping. So um, the Water Management District, Swift Mud, maps seagrass using aerial photography. So we've been doing that since 1988. Um, this gives us kind of a synoptic scale uh, approach to mapping uh, seagrass uh, habitat. We have two regions along the west coast of Florida that we map the Springs Coast, which is roughly from north of Tampa Bay up to just before Cedar Key. And then the Sun Coast, which is from Tampa Bay South to Charlotte Harbor. So that's what the map on the right shows you and all the various estuaries that are included within both of those uh, regions. The Springs Coast, we map every four years. We started mapping the Springs Coast in 07. The Sun Coast, we map every two years. And that's the, the region that we've been doing since 1988. And again, this is based on, on field verified photographic signatures. So while the focus of our maps has been and continues to be seagrass, um, we are obviously very interested and keyed into some of the, the issues that we've been seeing with respect to macroalgae, both attached, like the proliferans that we've been talking about over the last couple of days, but also the drift algae, the, the various types of both filamentous and, and, and the more sort of gracilaria type drift algae. So with that, um, Nate and I have been really looking at some of these uh, imagery that go back several years. And, and what, what Nate's been doing, and he's gonna take you through this in a little bit, is, is some of the, what I would call successional changes that we're seeing. And, and we think that's really important because it, it may help us understand uh, cause and effect relationships of what we're seeing. So I'm gonna hand it over to Nate to talk a little bit about how the photo interpretation process happens. Yes, thanks, Chris. Hi. Uh... My name is Nate Morton with Quantum Spatial in V5. So yes, uh, the photo interpretation we've done for Chris and past Swift Mud managers for a number of years, and we had some archival information. And we've been doing photo interpretation for quite some time. And uh, one, one of the images I have here, uh, we're gonna go through the elements of photo interpretation where we do utilize tone and color as well as uh, size, shape, and texture of the seagrass and algae patterns. Um, doing so, we can differentiate some of the seagrasses, as well as the species of seagrass and the algae. Uh, also referring to the Chlorpa attached algae that do map for the district and the drift algae that is not necessarily mapped and probably uh, would present difficult uh, mapping aspects due to the seasonality of the drift algae. Uh, these macroalgae uh, are extremely challenging, uh, the signatures, uh, especially when they're mixed. They're almost a signal to noise difference between the seagrass that we are mapping and the uh, algae that is more represented in the photo. Go ahead and go to the next slide, please. So what we have here is uh, some of our 2020 imagery that we flew for the district and our 2020 field verified photo points. So here we used a GoPro and this is just uh, offshore of Safety Harbor in the St. Joe's Sound area. Uh, we'll get to a slide here later 
that also will show this exact area. But what we see here is a continuous seagrass bed that has been uh, invaded, so to speak, by the macroalgae. And it's now in a recovery. Next. Here's a drift algae. Uh, this is that Calerpa fastigiata down in Charlotte Harbor, just off of Cape Coral. Um, what's interesting in this photo is near shore, we have some Halidouli. And as we go deeper here, the Calerpa is still attached to the sediment, but it's beyond the zone of the seagrass growth pattern. So our maps here um, show Calerpa beyond what we're mapping for Chris. Next. Let's see, this is an example near the Feather Sound area in the St. Pete Airport. And this is a dense, dense Calerpa prolifera bed. Um, hundreds of acres here of Calerpa in what typically used to be a seagrass meadow. Um, and some of the texture here we see in color um, are very similar to nice Thalassia and Halidouli patches. Um, what's also interesting in this picture is we have the scouring of the shallow meadow there uh, along that channel from the uh, drawdown of water from Hurricane Irma. Next. Uh, and we didn't want to just to show all uh, macroalgae, but uh, Chris asked me to add this slide. It was a good one. It's our Serangodium bed here uh, that we're off of um, Bishop Harbor. And uh, from the talks on Monday, it made me think that here we have kind of that microalgae that's now epiphytic on these uh, seagrass blades. And um, in the aerial imagery, we can see some patches of the seagrass as well as the continuous bed uh, to the east. Yeah, so Chris mentioned uh, how quantum and photoscience has mapped seagrass for the district uh, um, on a couple of occasions in the past. So luckily in-house we have in our archival information uh, this time series, so to speak. And to help augment the 2020 mapping of seagrass, we went ahead and uh, put into our digitizing effort uh, in the Esri environment this six paneled time series. So we can really start seeing that successional variation of drift algae and the seagrass meadows. Um, so in this particular area, and this is off Feather Sound in the hump, in 2008 and 2010, you can kind of see the circular pattern of the seagrass and how it uh, grows in a rhizomatic fashion. And there's some drift algae that are this dark, the darker uh, signature. Uh, sometimes it's speckled. And as we move through 2014, the meadow itself is starting to, I assume, to uh, have drift algae be constrained by the seagrass bed. And then as we move through 16 and 18, that drift algae really hasn't moved off the bed and is competing for the light and nutrients for the seagrass. And by 2020, it's a full calerpa bed um, as it's migrated. Next. Uh, same, similar area in Tampa Bay, just more to the west of where we just looked. Uh, this is another area where we have uh, seagrass patterns of circular, rhizomatic, and sometimes dark when they're at 100% uh, of a bed and the algae has moved on and moved off of it from 2014 and 16. And in 2018, uh, there are some seagrass remaining. And then in 2020, uh, another Calerpa prolifera bed. Next. Still in Old Tampa Bay, we're up near Mobley uh, Bay in Safety Harbor. And the 2020 imagery here is really interesting because this is a, uh, that dark signature is a fully 100% uh, calerpa bed. But there is some of that little purple color uh, right in the center of the 2020. And that's big uh, grassalaria 
um, a bloom. And we can see the migration uh, from 2008 to 2020, um, how the patterning of the longitudinal sandbar is present there and the persistence of this chlorpa bed. And Nate, I, I just want to add something, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this in a few minutes, but just, just for everyone's uh, understanding, these images are typically taken between the months of November and February. And as we've seen in, in some of the past talks, that even month to month variation really does matter. But we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later, but I just wanted to let everybody know that these images are typically taken between the months of November and uh, February. Right, so if we took these images in June, we'd have even more yeah. uh, dripped algae on these beds. Next. Uh, from Roger's talk on Monday, I thought that was great with the kitchen area in Hillsborough Bay. Um, uh, and I think this one might be mislabeled. I think this is the McDill Marina Channel. Oh, okay. So this is this is another interesting one because in 2016 we can see this channel entering into the McDill uh, Marina. The Clerpa bed to the east is is dominating, and to the west, um, it's probably drift algae with uh, Halidouli beds and the inter interdunal swales of the sediment. Um, and we can see in by 2020, the Clerpa bed still dominant to the east and to the west. Uh, a, a few patches of Halidulia are persisting. Next. This was an interesting day for uh, a field work. Chris and I visited the Irma Pass in Shell Key, and we actually noticed these patches in the imagery. And we wanted to visit them because they're very persistent. In 2020 now, there's a tidal flat invading this area, but we can see a donut ring around some of the hollowed out patches. And we actually investigated two to three of these where Serangodium was being infested with Gracilaria. And uh, it, when it was a full patch, the hollowed out patches, it was actually no more Serangodium and the Halidouli was out competing uh, by growing beyond the dying Serangodium. Uh, but then it was getting infested with the uh, Gracilaria until they were hollowed out and nothing. Yeah, the interesting thing about Irma Pass is, um, I, I don't know if Roger's still on, but back, I, I'd say probably 10 or 15 years ago, we, we were talking a lot in Feather Sound about the donuts and these, and these holes that would, or these, these donut holes that would happen in these seagrass, these patchy seagrass meadows. And a very similar thing is happening here in Irma Pass. So it's, it's really interesting to see the same you know, sort of successional dynamic happening here as it was in Feather Sound. Next. Um, this is from uh, Long Barnes, Sarasota Bay, and Dave uh, showed an aerial from 2019. So here is the 2020 aerial, um, just a complete loss of seagrass here from the algae that was really persistent from 2014 through 18. Next. From a previous talk today, Charlotte Harbor, um, the fastigiata in 2020 can also be seen in 2018. It's probably got the darkest signature here and the mat is continuous on the bed and there's lots of Gracilaria to the east of this longshore bar system along that whole eastern wall of Charlotte Harbor. And 2014, I did not have imagery for. Next. So um, kind of skip now to uh, not specific areas, but we did find this um, seasonal change that we wanted to highlight. In 2020, our we can see that the southern portion was collected in November and has a higher portion of drift algae. And uh, the next time around we got to fly one of these flight lines was in January. And we can see a stark contrast of the amount of biomass on the seagrass bed has really migrated off. And um, this is one of those effects what makes photo interpretation of this very challenging. 
because you can suspect that this seagrass bed has a lot of algae. And again, we're mapping the, the signal uh, and the noise where the sometimes the dominant thing is the algae. Next. Yeah, well, I just wanted to say too, it underscores the importance of knowing when your imagery is taken uh, for that very reason that you can see that stark contrast between January and November. And we're only talking with three months. Um, one of the things too, I'll add to this is, you know, we talked a little bit about global warming and how temperatures are rising. What we've noticed in our seagrass mapping over the years is that, you know, our typical flight window goes from November to January and that, or sorry, to February. And that's largely due to atmospheric conditions and, and the water clarity. But what we've noticed really over the last four or five years is that November is starting to look a lot more like September than it is December. And so we've actually uh, are discussing for our 22 maps, um, moving that flight window from November 1st of 21, possibly to December 1st or even later. And this is a big part of why, because November really is becoming more of a, a much warmer month. And Roger showed a really good plot of, of that, that macroalgal bloom in Hillsborough Bay in that October timeframe. And what we're seeing is that our November today is a lot like the October of yesterday. Yeah, good point. Uh, in conclusion, yeah, uh, we're using aerial imagery for the mapping of our al algae and seagrass. And I'll let Chris wrap it up. Yeah, so the thing, you know, we, what we really wanted to do is just kind of show you all a, a, a potential tool. You know, we're identifying in this workshop data gaps and what the things that we know, the things that we don't know, and the things that we should know. And so Nate and I have been working on looking at these aerial imagery for developing maybe some of these time series in areas of concern, places that we know, like Betty uh, was saying with the east wall of Charlotte Harbor. That's a, a really important area to monitor, not only because of the loss of seagrass and the increase in algae, but potentially so that we can document the recovery. So it's really important that we do that as well. And so we think that these images, while they're designed specifically for mapping seagrass, um, we can use them to, to perhaps give us some insight into some of these successional changes, which ultimately could lead to a better understanding of those underlying causal factors, which then ultimately could lead to implementation of management actions and projects that we could potentially do to help make these areas better. Um, I, again, I can't underscore the seasonal effect. That's really important. And in fact, after the workshop today, we're going out to test uh, a flight of, of one of the drones that they have here in house to uh, try to, to see if there is some of that potential for using uh, unmanned aerial systems for trying to fill in those gaps, uh, those temporal gaps. So we only map once every two years, but we know that there's a lot of dynamics that happen even from month to month. So it could be a, a, a good cost-effective way to augment the larger seagrass mapping effort that we do by employing these smaller drones to go out and, and collect very high resolution imagery at, at relatively low altitude to help us better understand those, uh, those dynamics. So that, that's really all we wanted to share with you today. Um, if we have time for questions, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, guys. Really interesting stuff, and I love I love the imaging. Um, so I'm going to switch over to my um, screen to show the Mentimeter questions. Do you want me to um, read them out, or can you guys do you want to look at them? Let's see what do we have here. Uh, what is that? You yeah. So we we it's funny. We were just talking about what's the the preferred nomenclature? Is it UAV, UAS, drone? Basically, all the same thing. Uh, let's see. So um, I'll take the middle one. So where do these recent increases in uh, macro and cover in Tampa Bay region figure into the story? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And, um, you know, there's a lot of, of, of uh, information and, and folks that are actually on this workshop today that remember what the Bay looked like, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Um, Tom Reese, who was one of the originators of the seagrass mapping program at SWCMA, um, he remembers the bay and, and, and could remember back in the late 80s, early 90s, he had a lot of calerpa in the bay, especially in old Tampa Bay and parts of Hillsborough Bay. And, and it seems that over time, those calerpa beds transitioned to seagrass. And 
you know, perhaps starting in 18, we started seeing a transition back to Palerpa. Yeah, I'll take that first one. Uh, historically, there might be some macroalgae lumped into the seagrass mapping. It's always been field verified if it becomes a Calerpa in the map. Uh, and that's all we, uh, the, the flux codes we map for Chris only includes Calerpa and it has to be field verified. So there could be potential uh, grassalaria as well as Calerpa uh, mixed in with seagrass mapping of past. Yeah, I can underscore the importance of the field verification and several of you that are in the workshop today um, have been really instrumental in providing us data to help that. We have our own crews go out. Nate's got his crews going out. We have independent accuracy assessment crews going out. And then just our partners, the counties, uh, the aquatic preserves, you know, Betty, she, she's been great with helping us to, to kind of piece that together. But yeah, field verification is really important in order to, to get to that question. And there was a second topic in that question. Uh, so our aerial imagery and the photo inter interpretation techniques are becoming better. Uh, so the new mapping, it's one foot. Uh, in the past, might have been a little different. We have different radiometers on our pack, uh, aerial acquisition uh, cameras. So they're picking up a denser color scheme than the older images. And that, and that hops to that question over that popped up uh, for the historical use of black and white photos. We cannot so use that. Um, the degradation of the, of the imagery is apparent in the black and white, but does help give you the uh, historical aspect. Um, Thanks, and, guys. And are we done? With this, or do we have time for one more? Um, I, I think I'd like to give Brian some time as well, um, if it. that's okay. Yep. But I have all the questions and um, we will we will hopefully be able to talk more about this. Um, I know, uh, Chris, you're presenting tomorrow as well. Um, so I know you're around, um, but uh, we'll make sure we follow up with the other questions. And, uh, and Carolyn, if, uh, for those of you who are in the Tampa Bay working group, I'm, I'm facilitating that breakout group. So if, if any of you uh, are the ones that ask some of these questions, we can talk more about that too in a bit. Sounds great, thank you. All right, so hopefully Brian, you can unmute and um, we can ask some of these questions that came out of your talk earlier. Um, so, there's a, hopefully a quick question. Would NH3 be a decent surrogate for NH4 plus? Well, it would, um, you know, typically depending on the pH of the water, um, typically uh, the, that form of nitrogen NH3 is more in the form of ammonium, the four plus than the, uh, the three plus. But if, um, depending on your analyses, um, you know, you, you can measure either one, but you got to realize in, in the waters we've been monitoring, uh, ammonium NH4 plus is the dominant form at uh, seawater pH that we typically work at. Great. Uh, do you want to pick another question or would you like me to read them? Oh, let's see. Um, Yeah, you go, go ahead and read them if you'd like, the ones you um, think. Okay, it says, with the keys, were they able to bring the system back from over the tipping point with all their nutrient control measures? You had shown a picture of a very nice uh, wastewater treatment uh, plant. Yeah, uh, well, um, as we learned from Tampa Bay, as Roger really described so well on Monday, it takes a long time for these systems to come back if, if they ever really can. And in the case of the Florida Keys, when we're talking um, corals like that brain coral I showed in my talk that's hundreds of years old, obviously we're not gonna grow that back anytime soon. Um, but, um, and, and, and the system is still loaded you know, with, with nutrients. We're seeing improvements in the near shore, but not necessarily the regional uh, system and particularly offshore areas where we're still seeing a lot of green water and elevated ammonia nitrate. Um, we just published a long-term study a couple of years ago showing that uh, that long-term trend in DIN and SRP and the N2P ratios at Lou Key showing how the N2P ratios have gone up there, just like they have in the sargassum. 
uh, that's collected further offshore. So um, this I is something, yeah, this yeah. is something we're seeing in a widespread um, region in, in the Florida Keys. And it's, we, we do believe, we have evidence it's quite stressful to the corals. They become limited by phosphorus and um, it can exacerbate bleaching and diseases. Yeah, yeah so, that's a really good point. And I think the, the system, the coral systems versus, um, you know, maybe some of the farther north ecosystems might be a little bit different. But I do know we're going to have some talks tomorrow looking at um, management stories and management success stories. So a follow up on the same question from the same person was, is this an example of how systems can be, you know, how you can reverse the overabundance of macroalgae growth? So maybe we'll just say stay tuned for some success stories tomorrow. Yeah, and hopefully over time, uh, as, as we will see more improvements in lower macroalgae blooms in, in the near shore, we, we still see quite a bit down here, in part due to uh, regional increased flows, really since 2013, more water being moved south into the Florida Bay, Florida Keys region. So we're doing a good job locally, I think, but we're being affected by um, you know, the mainland runoff from Florida. Great. I'm going to just pick one more question quickly. So we want to get to our breakout groups. Do this, the current Everglades restoration plan adequately guard against a repeat of Western Florida Bay and Florida Keys eutrophication that you saw in the 1990s? It's a loaded question. <laughs> that is. And, uh, you know, this is a, a, a big issue down here in the Florida Keys. This, um, you know, this restoration plan was based on salinity. Uh, the thinking at that time was the salinity was too high, not just in the bay, but it was argued even the reefs that it was stressing the corals. And of course, it was really like a, uh, a, a regional do nutrient dosing experiment with massive amounts of fresh water coming in. And unfortunately, it had a lot of unintended consequences that were very negative. Um, and, and I think hopefully we have learned something from that. And since that time in the early 90s, we have reduced flows in shark slough, um, mainly not, not due to improving you know, water quality in the middle and lower keys that suffered so badly in the early 90s, but to protect the Cape Sable Seaside Sparrow, uh, keep the water levels lower in, in shark slough. So that, that little sparrow has probably helped us quite a bit. Thank you, thank you. I'm sure there's so much more we could talk about with all of these questions. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to, uh, hopefully you guys are seeing the facilitated breakouts slide. Is that, is that what you're seeing? Um, and we are going to switch over. I really appreciate all the speakers, The Presentations were so great. We could, we're gonna talk more about all these topics um, in our individual breakouts. So um, I have a few, you know, just highlighted instructions here that I wanna remind both the facilitators and the participants. So there's four estuaries with five breakout groups. The Indian River Lagoon um, has two breakouts because there's so many folks and that's fine because we're gonna collate all this information together in the end. Um, if you're sent to the wrong breakout, please return to the main room and, um, you know, verbally ask to get reassigned. Um, uh, Christine Quigley will be in the main room for anybody that needs to jump from breakout room to breakout room. And we'd love it if you, if you speak up and just make sure that you get to your right breakout so that we can really get a download of your information. Uh, the Jamboard, Menti, and Google Notes links are all going to be used and will be put in the chat box of your breakout group, as well as they are referenced in emails that you already have. Um, and so just a reminder um, to share knowledge and have fun. Um, we really want to get a lot out of these breakouts. Um, and then just a reminder to the facilitators to please hit record when you go into your breakouts um, and, and, you know, Good luck, I guess I'll say. And I will pause there for any um, questions. If you have questions, you can put them in the chat and you can also um, ask your breakout group uh, facilitator if you have any questions. Hey, great, thanks Caroline. Um, I think I'll ask Christine to go ahead and open our breakout rooms. Um, we tried to pre-assign as many people as we could. So hopefully you should be able to just 
uh, automatically go in. Um, if you are not assigned, um, what you'll need to do is hopefully you have an option to choose your own breakout room. Um, and you can go ahead and do that. Um, we may need to shuffle around the Indian River Lagoon people